Good evening. I think we're going to get started. Welcome to the School of Medicine and Dentistry's uh, Women in Medicine Road to Self Advocacy series. Before we get started, just a few reminders. The session is being recorded and will be shared. My Women in Medicine Network colleague, Dr. Heidi Schwartz, will be addressing any of the pre submitted questions from registration later on in the discussion. During the Q&A period, you may also raise your hand to be called on or submit your question or comment through the chat. At this time, please set your Zoom view to gallery view and remember to mute yourself. Let's get started. My name is Dr. Nancy Kwan. I'm the Vice Chair of the Department of Emergency Medicine at Long Island Jewish Medical Center and member of the Women in Medicine Network. This is the first installment of a virtual four session series sponsored by the School of Medicine and Dentistry's Women in Medicine Network. The series is designed to help educate, engage and empower fellow alumni and students through their career in medicine with each session, exploring a topic centered around the theme of self-advocacy for women in medicine. It is my pleasure to introduce tonight's speakers to you. Our first speaker will be Dr. Allison Whalen, Chief Academic Officer of the Association of American Medical Colleges. Allison Whalen, MD, became the AAMC's Chief Academic Officer in January 2021. In this role, Dr. Whalen oversees efforts that prepare and assist deans, faculty leaders, educators, and future physicians for the challenges of the 21st century's academic medicine. Prior to joining the AAMC in 2016, Dr. Whalen served as a professor of medicine and pediatrics at the Washington University School of Medicine in St. Louis. While there, she held multiple education roles during her tenure, including course director, clerkship director, curriculum dean, and the inaugural senior associate dean for education. An internist and clinical geneticist, Dr. Whalen continued both clinical care and research involvement until she left the Washington Uni University St. Louis School of Medicine. She created and ran the Hereditary Cancer Clinic, co-ran an interdisciplinary Marfan Clinic, was co-director of the Siteman Cancer Center Hereditary Cancer Research Corps, and served five years on the Siteman Cancer Center Executive Committee. Joining Dr. Whalen is Diana Lautenberger, Director for Gender Equity Initiatives of the Association of American Medical Colleges. Diana Lautenberger, MA, manages the double AMC's gender equity pro portfolio as the Director for Gender Equity Initiatives to integrate gender equity approaches across the association's missions and work. The GE portfolio includes gender equity research education and projects to promote equitable working environments, as well as developing resources for marginalized populations in academic medicine. Ms. Lautenberger also serves as a faculty member for the AAMC's Leadership Development Seminars for Early and Mid-Career Women, as well as a work stream lead for the Creating Safe and Inclusive Environments Goal as part of the AAMC's Strategic Action Plan. Prior to her current role, Ms. Lautenberger managed the Group on Women in Medicine and Science and the Group on Diversity and Inclusion, collaborating with faculty, staff, and leaders at academic medical centers to advance diversity, equity, and inclusion. And now I, I will turn the program over to Dr. Allison Whelan for her uh, presentation. So we, we welcome her. Thank you so much, Nancy. We're absolutely delighted to be here um, and to join you all on your journey to self-advocacy. So I thought I would set the stage by sharing a brief version of my professional and self-advocacy story. So when I went to medical school, in my class, we were about 30% women. I entered a competitive internal medicine residency at a research intensive place that had about 20% women in our residency program and very, very few women faculty um, in, at the whole school. Um, I worked hard um, and um, was rewarded as being one of the first women chief residents in our program. I worked really hard as a chief resident. I did well, and I was invited to join the faculty. Um, as you heard, I had a foot in all three mission areas, and I loved it. I felt lucky to be doing good work. I felt lucky to be in a good place. I felt lucky to be getting paid to do the good work that I loved. 
And I worked hard, really, really hard. I did whatever was asked. I joined whatever committees I was asked to join. And I had a life. I had three kids. Um, all before I was uh, done being an assistant professor, I had six weeks of maternity leave for each. I returned full time on day one after six weeks. I felt guilty about leaving my kids so early. I felt guilty that my colleagues had to take up the slack while I was gone. And I was grateful that my retired dad was able to take care of them for a few weeks each until they were old enough to go to the daycare that we were lucky enough to get a spot in. And now they're all grown up, they are thriving, and I have honestly have a terrific relationship with each of them. And I got promoted. And I was even more grateful and happy to be doing the work I was doing. And I was tired. I was very tired. And while I talk all the time to my colleagues about patients and cases and research and teaching, it never occurred to me to ask about their workload or their time distribution or their salary. So fast forward, I was promoted professor. As you heard, I was the inaugural senior associate dean. And I now have a major national leadership position. Some would argue the biggest, most important, or at least most visible med ed job in the nation. So I made it, despite the fact that I actually didn't start my self-advocacy journey for the first half of my career. That's right. I did not attend a single women in medicine session or personal professional development session until I was well into being an associate professor. And that event was literally mind blowing. It was the first time that I saw the data on unbalanced workloads between women and men that I heard about the salary discrepancies, that I learned that the earlier they start, the more they actually um, are exponentially impactful on your overall lifetime um, earnings. And honestly, and it's probably hard for you all to believe, um, that really heard about the deep culture of gender bias. It's hard to admit, but back then, I just assumed that we all got rewarded for our hard work equally. And I actually thought everyone was working as hard as I was. And that, that culture that I now see as mansplaining and being talked over, the interruptions, the instructions to smile more, um, and the need to tell sports stories to be part of the team, not the sports team, the healthcare team, was just the way it was. And it was just the way it was. But it doesn't have to be. And it shouldn't be. And while progress has been made, and there's, there's still much to be done. So now that I'm in a position of influence, I'm working to change that for individual women and for our systems. So what I have learned is knowing the facts is sobering and mind blowing and really knocks you upside the head at the first time you hear it. But knowing that allows you to know that you need to act and having data and tools and resources can be empowering. And talking and sharing and networking can be life-changing. So my colleague Diana and I are delighted to kick off this series by sharing a lot of facts, a lot of data, tools, and resources. Diana is a deep subject matter expert on this, so I was delighted that she was able to join me for this session. Because I made it, I did. I'm, I'm happy and I'm doing well. And I want you to make it too, but hopefully with less work, less exhaustion, less unnecessary stress, less bias and more equitable support than I had. So I'm gonna turn it over to Diana to equip you for your journey. Um, for those of you who are further along in your journey it will likely be a refresher. And for those of you who are senior and can also say, yeah, I made it, then maybe we'll give you the tools to reach back and help others um, so that they can um, join you in your success with a little less effort than you maybe had. Diana, over to you. Thanks so much, Allison. And I'm just really uh, delighted to be here and really honored to work with Allison every single day and also share this stage with her because I think as Allison outlined and really kicked us off well, uh, there is all of the real experience that we need to think about, that we need to reflect about. And then there's all of the, the fun other stuff which is data um, and really understanding some of these concepts and how they really show up in our institutions all the time. So a little bit about what we're gonna do, uh, hopefully over the next uh, 30, 35 minutes or so, 
Um, we've already heard some personal reflections on gender equity and career advancement, um, how that can be constructed, where they can kind of go off the rails and things that we learn either earlier or later in our careers. And I think we'll have some time for Q&A uh, at the end and, and a lot of rich discussion that we wanna hear from you all. But we also wanna learn about this current state of women's representation, but more than just representation, experiences. How does gender equity and gender bias really manifest today and what are some institutional things that we can do? Um, and understanding these newer, more contemporary ways that gender bias comes out in the climate and in our culture, since we've moved beyond you know, these very overt things around sexual harassment, they're a little bit harder to see. And so it's important that we describe them. We see that they are grounded in data so that we understand how to use that information to really propel us forward and to empower us to advance our careers even more. And I wanna point out that um, I'm gonna be approaching all of these, uh, all of this information and these data through really the lens of diversity, equity, and inclusion and showing how we have different data and different concepts to support each one of these, uh, these concepts. And so when we talk about diversity, equity, inclusion, we really need to be approaching them uh, together. And we really need to have all three if we're gonna be making any um, equitable advancements. So I've broken down the presentation into these, uh, to these focus areas. So we understand how important representation is, how we understand okay, now we need to get to equitable processes. How do we bring more equity to the workplace? And then this third part around inclusion and what does that really look like in the culture? So we'll start out with um, really the representational and that's what we think about when we think about the concept of diversity. When we're looking at the numbers, the proportions of folks who are coming into academic medicine and then also maybe who is leaving academic medicine. So some folks may be familiar with this graphic, um, and this comes from, it's an executive summary graphic from um, our most recent uh, State of Women in Academic Medicine report, which was a few years old now, uh, but we are thinking about uh, revisiting these data and probably putting this a newer report, refreshing these data and putting a report out in the next couple of years. But this shows us this typical pathway that we like to describe of people who are entering medical school all the way through um, all of the leadership positions, faculty ranks, through to um, potential batter up leadership positions and then all the way to deans. So we know that we're doing a great job so far of getting women into medical school, getting them interested in medical school, through medical school. But we do see that there are slight drop-offs in these um, learner focused areas when we look at 51% of all applicants to medical school are women. There's a little bit of a drop off when we get to who's actually graduating. And so there are some opportunities for us to think about um, retention there. It's a little bit more of a drop off when we get to residents. Um, and then there's a little bit even more of a drop off when we get to faculty. So we really are at this point, I think the snapshot today is actually we're at 42% of all full-time faculty are women, which shows great progress. And we're gonna go into some of those data in a little bit. But then when we start to look at leadership positions, and we're, we don't need to jump straight to department chair, we can think about what are some of these batter up positions that really lead to that. We've got a lot more work to do, um, and the numbers really aren't translating quite as much, where about a third or less of division chiefs, full professors, senior associate deans, um, and even, more le even less uh, chairs are women. And so when we think about what this looks like in comparison to all physicians, uh, faculty, we're actually doing pretty well when we consider that 37% of all practicing physicians are women. Um, we're doing a great job of getting women interested in faculty positions. I would argue we can do better. Uh, and we need to be increasing that, uh, those numbers coming in even more, but it is a slightly better. And I do wanna make the important clarification that we've had a huge jump in the number of women deans and when I say huge jump, I think it's four or five, <laughs> um, but that really does change the percentage of women deans um, where when this report came out a few years ago, we, we were looking at only 18% of deans being women. That actually has jumped up to 25. I think it's interesting from a contextual perspective of in great times of crisis, i.e. over COVID, um, when we really hand over these you know, institutions, when we've got times of crises, to women, and there are some data to support that, but 
will take the leadership positions and we're happy that there, um, that there is a movement in that area. I think it's really important for us to address this idea of the, the pathway and this idea that, that we hear all the time of, well, if we just get enough women into medical school, it will all eventually uh, figure itself out in the end. And so I like to use this graphic because I think it really helps us answer some of these questions. Where if you look at the red line, that is the proportion of women graduating from medical school all the way back to 1980. Now in about 1995, we had 40% of all medical school graduates were women, which is not parity, that's not even, but it's a pretty good cohort. That's a pretty robust number of folks. And so when we think about where those women uh, who, if they came into faculty positions, where they should be today, we're not seeing anything comparable in those statistics or proportions to 40%. We just showed you the division chief, senior associate deans, um, department chairs, 25 years later or, or more, where would the, that cohort of women medical students uh, and where would it be that 40%? And we're really not seeing that translating into the numbers. So that tells us we've got a little bit more of an issue as far as this pathway. Um, some folks use the word pipeline. We, we're starting to move away from that. So that's why we call it a pathway issue. Uh, it really is not the uh, silver bullet for this answer, right? There are things going on in the culture and the climate that are impacting those numbers from coming in. And it's important that we don't just look at raw numbers. We have to get really specific ab about um, breaking these data down, disaggregating them to understand where women are or are not actually coming into these faculty positions. So this is showing men and women, you know, over the past 10 years, coming into faculty. Some people would look at this graphic and say, we're making progress. To me, it, it looks almost stagnant. Um, so it really is in the eye of the beholder. I think we could be doing better in terms of our faculty numbers, um, but they really are starting to taper off a little bit when you look at where there may have been jumps. Um, but even more specific than that, we have to pay attention, again, disaggregating these data to look at where are there um, really, really small proportions when we are looking in basic science numbers or MD, PhDs, again, the women are in purple at the bottom. Instead of approaching women as faculty, we really need to start thinking about what departments are they going into? What are the degree types? And are we missing a large cohort of women in a particular area of, uh, of either basic science or clinical? And how can we really address those specific needs? Again, thinking about into the point of disaggregation, um, we are very excited that we've got 42% women. We think we can be doing better. But if we're not looking at that over time by rank, we're really missing part of the story. And so again, this is looking over 10 years, um, pretty parallel improvements in terms of each one of our faculty ranks over time. But what is interesting to me is that even though we're only 42% of uh, full-time faculty are women, we are overrepresented. It is 58% of those faculty today, or maybe even more now, are instructors. So this tells us that while we are making improvements for faculty, women are still getting overwhelmingly hired into their initial faculty appointments um, at lower ranks. So coming in as instructors, um, where 60% of all instructors then are women, we've got some real opportunities in terms of thinking about mentoring of how we're negotiating first job contracts. And I know that there are some questions about that that we'll address later. Um, wh what are the positions, what are the faculty ranks that we're really mentoring women into in terms of those first contracts? And then it's critical that we do not think about women as a monolith. There are so many different intersecting identities. And when we talk about women in medicine and science, what does that mean? <laughs> Who are we talking about when we talk about women in academic medicine? And so for, for us, it's really critical to always be looking intersectionally at these data um, because they tell a really compelling story. Again, over the last 10 years, when we look at uh, this, this snapshot, it's just of women faculty over the last 10 years, broken down by race and ethnicity. Um, really over the last 10 years, we have done very little to diversify our women faculty. 
basically the proportions of Asian and white women flip-flopped where we lost 3% and added 3%. For all of our other women of color faculty, there was virtually no difference or no improvement made in those representations among faculty ranks. So we need to start thinking about is, is it that we're not getting those faculty in? Is it an attrition problem that the culture and the climate uh, is contributing to us losing those faculty? So again, disaggregating our data really tells a powerful story. Instead of thinking that women are this monolith that all have the same experiences, we really need to be looking by department, by race and ethnicity, sexual orientation, gender identity, and so many other factors. Now that brings us to thinking about leadership. Um, and this is a really busy slide. It's kind of hard <laughs> to take it all in at once, but something new that we wanted to do with our data this past year was look at not just the three deaconal ranks, which is on the left side of your screen, um, but to also look across the administrative dean areas where women were really shaking out. So if we start with the left side of the screen first, and then we'll get to the crazy bingo mat that's on the right, um, we got to, again, break down these deaconal positions by assistant associate and senior associate dean. And when we show this graphic to some folks, we usually get, um, you know, great job. We're doing a great job of getting women into these assistant dean and associate dean positions at about half. Um, and we always put a little bit of a cautionary tale um, on the end note of that takeaway, because we know that women are being handed these or given these titles, um, but we know that these titles come with a lot of responsibility, a lot of work. You all of a sudden have a lot more work to do, but you don't have a staff, you don't have a budget, um, and you don't really have a lot of decision-making power or, or, or there's the responsibility without the power that comes with it. So, and we can really see that bear out in the numbers here, where when we jump then to senior associate dean, the numbers drop off quite a bit with those positions that confer much grander titles, a lot more money and resources. Now, of course, the money and resources really depends on which office you're in. So if we turn to the uh, right side of the slide, we can already see the graphic of where women are really overrepresented, again, 42% of all full-time faculty, where we see women most concentrated and overrepresented really are in those departments that we know are heavy, people heavy, take a lot of time, a lot of mentoring, a lot of networking, a lot of conversation with folks, but also don't really have large institutional budgets. So when we look at some of these other departments like clinical affairs um, or research affairs, you can see just how low some of the numbers of women who are in those departments are. So it's really important for us to um, consider, again, breaking all of these data down. We can't just take one snapshot. We really need to understand where women are being concentrated. And because of that concentration, where are we missing out on the talents that diversity really brings us in some of these other offices? So that's a little bit about our diversity aspect, our representation, where women really are in academic medicine. So this helps us move then to thinking about equitable working environments and how does gender equity or gender inequity really play out in the workplace in all of its different forms. Now we know that there are lots of research studies out there um, and I won't take a ton of time to go through these because I think some folks are, are pretty familiar with some of these. And, and if you're not, I'm happy to send these references in terms of women getting less um, responses to emails to professors for mentoring time. Um, we all know about the resume studies where they are carbon copy resumes, but um, white folks and men get 50% more callbacks than women or people of color. People may uh, be familiar with the Grand Rounds introduction study that was done a few years ago of looking at whether we use doctor um, when we're introducing men or women. I think we all know the answer to that one. And even things around um, hiring for lab manager positions, men get hired more often again with the same resume, but not only that, when they are hired, they're offered a higher starting salary for those um, for women who are also hired for the same position. So we've got lots of examples about um, hiring, 
mentoring, you know, uh, interviews, all of that type of stuff that we want to go into a little bit more detail. One book that I think that some folks are probably not familiar with is this really fascinating book called Just One of the Guys by Kristen Schilt. And uh, in this book, they interviewed about 50, I think, trans men who've been in the workplace both as men and as women. And their stories about the differences in their environment are shocking. I mean, overnight in some of these cases of promotions or salary increases um, or you know, people saying, wow, you do so much, much better work than your sister does uh, when it's really the same person. And so this, this book really gives us some unique opportunities to give some evidence base to the gender inequalities that we're really seeing in the workplace um, as people who have lived as both genders. So getting a little bit more into some of these other equity uh, data that we know, this is a snapshot from our first faculty salary equity report that we did a few years ago, um, where we found that on average, and again, we got to break it down by the different departments and the different degree types, but on average, we found that women were paid 82 cents on the dollar to men in academic medicine. And again, we can see that the variation between those who are in clinical departments and basic science departments is vast, um, but it is still inequitable nonetheless. And so that's up on our website. There's a, there are a ton of graphics um, if people are interested in that report. But I also wanted to show um, a, date, a data snapshot from our most recent uh, faculty salary equity report, which also looked at uh, salaries by gender as well as race and, race and ethnicity. And it was really important for us to try and understand the, the dynamics and the interplay between race and gender when we're talking about salary. And so what we found, um, and again, this is using AAMC compensation data, we found that in every racial and ethnic category, women in that category were making less than their men counterparts, um, which shows you, you know, you can go down and, and kind of see what the, um, what the differences were there. And the numbers that are on the right, that's within the racial and ethnic category cents on the dollar difference. So to us, this was a really big takeaway, um, you know, as part of our overall DEI work, uh, really looking at gender being the primary driving factor when we're talking about salary equity as opposed to um, race and ethnicity. Now, when we think about the differences uh, in salary, we have to wonder what goes into that and what are all of the environmental things and structures that really create this idea that some are more deserving of more or less um, money. And there are lots of different things. And so understanding how these come out in our environment is really, really important. And so this is a really great study from 2018 that, that was done about um, just looking at the words that were used in performance reviews uh, with men and women. And in this study, they found that overwhelmingly more positively associated words were uh, associated with men or written about with men more frequently and more negatively associated words were used more frequently with women. And so this was, you know, across 80,000 different performance reviews and the, the similarities of those performance reviews and the frequency of these words occurring is just one piece of the puzzle when we think about why folks get promoted, why folks um, end up earning more money, why folks even get hired when we're thinking about letters of recommendation and all of the problematic issues that can come out in something as simple as a letter of recommendation. So just considering the ways in which we write about men and women very differently is one piece of that puzzle of how these things come out differently in our environment. There is also this concept of the double bind and folks may be familiar with this study. It's been deemed the Heidi V. Howard study um, where there were two, two uh, uh, fictional bosses, um, but it, they were exactly the same. Again, carbon copy of a description but one of these had Heidi and one of the other one had Howard at the top. And so when folks read Heidi's description of them and thinking about them as a boss or a supervisor, they said, sure, she's competent, but I don't wanna work for her because I probably don't like her very much. And then reading the same uh, snapshot of this potential supervisor, they say, yep, competent. And I wanna work for them because I think I probably really like them. 
And so what this has shown us, and there's been a lot written about this now, and again, thinking about this contextually as an equity issue, this double bind when we're thinking about leadership, how we write and talk about leadership, who we think of and imagine and suggest and mentor for leadership positions, is this double bind that women leaders can be seen as competent or likable, but you can't be both. We know in the United States context, what we think about when we think about a leader is someone that is very charismatic and knows what they're doing. And so we already then know this is another piece of that puzzle that we're filling in of if we've got this double bind for women coming into academic medicine that I either think they're really great at their job or that they're likable, but they can't be both, that really presents some, some significant challenges for getting more women into leadership positions. We also think about our finalist candidate pool. So beyond just recommending someone for a leadership, when you're actually getting uh, into search committees or, or thinking about hiring folks, um, there's been a lot of push recently to make sure that finalist candidate pools are diverse. Now, when we have a statement as general as that, there could be a lot of room for interpretation, right? And so this is a really great study from, again, from a few years ago, looking at about 600 faculty positions. So we are talking about um, higher education that showed that in a finalist candidate pool, if only one of those finalists was a woman, there was statistically zero chance that that person would be hired. And of course that, that chance increases with the more folks you have um, in that finalist candidate pool, but it really gives us some signals about how seriously institutions are taking this finalist candidate pool um, question. Um, and if it's more of just, you know, let's check, check it off the box, um, we can see then how that really doesn't translate into us diversifying either our faculty or our leadership ranks or our deans or department chairs. Beyond these, we know that there are um, real safety issues when talking about the climate of academic medicine and in terms of the behaviors that we experience, the words and the environment that we experience um, with regard to sexual harassment. And we're about to publish a brand new publication on sexual harassment uh, next month, um, or actually in a couple of weeks, uh, it's right around the corner. But I'll give you a little sneak peek of what we found in that report is that one in three women and one in eight men faculty experience harassment in academic medicine. And that comes in a variety of different behaviors and how people really experience that. And it's important for us to think about these behaviors that are beyond maybe what we would traditionally think of sexual harassment as the really overt sexual assault, touching, um, other things like that, which is still critically important and, and illegal, but we also have to focus on these other less overt, more covert behaviors that we are actively tolerating in the environment be because I think namely there is no legal recourse for them, right, for gender harassment or for microaggressions. So this also paints some of that picture of the climate in terms of when we're thinking about how to create equitable climates um, and what we really need to take into consideration. And I'll underscore again, just the importance of really having a fundamental understanding um, of what intersectionality really means. Because I think sometimes we um, approach these issues one ism at a time, right? It was racial justice last year and you know, gender equality was the year before that and LGBTQIA was before the year before that and disability rights before that without realizing that we have colleagues and friends who show up to work with multiple identities, with many of these identities. And sometimes when we approach DEI in this way, um, we're really asking our colleagues to pick and choose which ID, uh, identity they should come to with work for that day. And we, we can approach these things um, as single issues because we don't live single issue lives as Audrey Lord so eloquently said. So when we approach all of these issues of equity and inclusion, we really do need to do it um, with this intersectional lens, which tells us that it's not about attacking one ism at a time, it's really about us um, 
redoing the system and dismantling the oppression and really going to the source, which is dominant culture. And so that really leads us to this idea of inclusion and what are we really seeing and what are the opportunities that we have to go forward. So at this point, it's the, the goal of this presentation is not to depress you, <laughs> even though it might seem that way, but we wanna know what to do with all this information. I mean, probably many of us have sat on many of these calls, um, thinking about the data, being exposed to the data. What do we do with all this information? And knowing the data, it, I think it does help us make much more informed decisions about how to improve our policies and our climate. But I think more than that, it's really important to know that these are systemic issues. It's, and it's not about, and what we want to encourage is for individual folks to not internalize these negative messages that we get about women or other marginalized folks. And really understanding how that plays out and, and understanding the systems and really going after the system in that case, because we've got some really strong cultural narratives um, at play about women that are really pervasive. Um, for example, we know that women actually negotiate almost as much, not equal, but almost as much as men. They just aren't given it. They aren't rewarded for their negotiation. We know women express almost as much interest in leadership as men, but we've clearly seen the data on leadership. It doesn't look like it's close at all. And we know that women and men go part-time at, at similar rates. Women go a little bit uh, more often, but at similar rates, it's not wildly different. But we know that men do research and do things to advance their career in that uh, time off, and women do caretaking or other service work, um, or they're actually still you know, full time in reality. So being empowered with these data is one part of it, absolutely. But we also have to address these systems that keep advantaging some and disadvantaging others by pushing people to the margins and really understanding how this functions within dominant culture is really, really critical. Because there's some really interesting information about how about 40 to 46% of American men um, think that the pay gap is, is wildly exaggerated, that they basically don't believe it. And about a third of men don't think that gender bias is really a significant problem anymore. So if, we're, if we've got all of this information, how are we empowered and what good does it do us if we're not actually going to the source of dominant culture and, and understanding why these systems don't change? So I think it's really important for us to interrogate that question and to think about our status quo bias. And I love this quote because I think it really helps us understand that these things aren't always intentional, that humans are designed to seek comfort and order. We are just naturally. So if we have comfort and order, they tend to plant themselves there. Even if your comfort isn't all that comfortable and even if they secretly want for something better. And so I think this is so critical because we often villainize and we create an us versus them mentality when we come to equality um, or equity and inclusion issues, when we really have to bring folks into the conversation and understand that this is a status quo bias. Humans naturally want to be comfortable, and these are inherently uncomfortable conversations. We are asking folks to get uncomfortable. And it really is incumbent upon those in the dominant culture to get uncomfortable and to think about these things and to have these, um, these conversations. But we do have to acknowledge that it's not always intentional because that gives us a really easy scapegoat, but I don't think it always um, gets us to where we need to go. So if we're gonna be intentional in changing the system, which um, there's a lot of talk right now about how the system is broken um, and the system isn't broken. Systems are designed to get the exact result that they're designed for, right? Um, so in that way, our system is designed perfectly because it was designed by a very specific person, generalizing a, an older white straight man who had a caregiver at home. That's why we have the system that we have. So it really is interrogating and being intentional about reworking and changing this system. 
And I, this term institutional systems, I think is really vague. So what do we mean by that? So it's everything from how work is done and completed. What are our expectations about that? How are members of the community supposed to interact and interrelate and communicate with one another? How do we even think about personal versus professional? Or do we even need to have a difference between those two things? Can we bring more of our personal lives into our work? And that's reworking the system in and of itself. Thinking about how decisions are made. Is it group think and whoever's got the loudest voice and raises their hand, sure, we'll go with that. Do we have a more intentional system about how we make really important decisions? Thinking about how work is allocated, who has power and influence um, as opposed to or in distinction of formal leadership titles. All of these questions or all of these points are ways that we can start to reinvent that system not just put a Band-Aid over it, but really start to have intentional conversations about these things. And how many teams have never had a conversation about this? It's just implied and it's understood. And that's dominant culture status quo at play. One area that I think we have a lot of work to do if we are going to um, interrogate this dominant culture system, and we're gonna think about how to create these more equitable environments, I really think that we need to stop this conflation of gender, meaning certain characteristic traits. And this, this can be generalized for some, but I wanna encourage folks to think about and to potentially rework our thinking of, for example, men lead this way, women lead this way. Um, because that does a couple of things that I think are not productive if we are really going for equitable environments. First is that it actually reinforces gender stereotypes. It doesn't dismantle them. And because of that, or that's because it really punishes those who don't conform to those societal gender norms. So it actually is reinforcing that one gender is this way and another gender is this way. Whereas you might have a woman who doesn't lead in a overly compassionate collaborative way, you know, where they're getting input from everyone. And so societally, we punish that person for not aligning with their gender in the same way as if a man wants to, to lead in that way, we also punish them for that way. And I, the second thing I think that that does is that it continues to create this us versus them mentality of again, bucketing one whole gender versus another whole gender. Instead, what I would offer is that we think about what are the current dominant traits that academic medicine values and rewards and how can we reimagine those stripped of gender assignments so that we're creating the most inclusive, equitable environment possible. Some, and this is generalizations, this is not all environments or institutions or departments in academic medicine, but there's a lot of evidence base to, that talks about the current dominant traits that are not really serving us that are creating hostile exclusionary environments are overly competitive uh, environments, ones that are hyper focused on individualism, you and you alone, where overconfidence is valued, where if you don't really know what you're doing, but you can kind of fake it till you make it, that's great. This false sense of urgency that everything needs to be done right now. Um, and in order for you to do that one thing, you as the lone genius needs to go out and do it. These are things that are actually valued and rewarded in academic medicine. And we may traditionally attach a gender to these particular things. But how do we offer alternative modes of being and thinking for each one of these uh, characteristics or these traits? And there are many, many more. How can we start to talk about this ideal environment that we want where collaboration, partnership, being thoughtful, questioning if we actually know what we're doing and really leveraging the collective genius instead. And the way that this may come out um, is really in the little things and thinking about our language very, very intentionally. When we say things like what professional appearance looks like, whether or not we talk about what appropriate behavior in a meeting is, what are normal business hours, what is a comfortable work environment? While there's nothing overt about um, any of these statements, these do communicate really powerful messages of that 
comes from dominant culture that are coded to control and really reify the types of being that we expect in academic medicine. And so that's really what we're talking about when we're talking about resetting the environment and inclusive language and thinking about the, the characteristic traits that we value and reward um, is, is an essential part of that. All right, so what are some steps that organizations can do? There are a lot of things. Um, we've obviously talked about um, tracking data. Uh, we've talked a ton about data today, and that's really, really important. And there are other things that we know we need to do to help with that more equity and inclusion part of the puzzle. Lots of work around mentorship and sponsorship. We're seeing a lot of new examples of starting allyship groups that are specifically for men, for them to get together and to talk about all their dominant culture stuff and ask these questions and have these conversations. And how can we explore that, especially if we're talking about this um, large proportions of men aren't really buying this whole gender equity or gender inequity conversation. Making sure that we've got someone accountable, putting bias or reporting systems in place, and then there are lots of promising practices around de-biasing our systems because we've just got those unconscious biases that really inhibit us from making informed um, objective decisions. Uh, there was a great book, if uh, folks are familiar with the advanced grants out of the NSF, uh, there are a couple of authors that took a bunch of those institutions and wrote up all the great work that they're doing. Um, and they really shook out in uh, some interesting categories of what are the bias limiting institutional structures. Probably no surprises, we've talked about a lot of them here uh, in terms of really why women aren't advancing in uh, STEM fields, but then they also offer solutions directly from those programs. So it's a really fascinating um, solution oriented read. And just as I wrap up here, uh, we've got some resources, but I do like to uh, always end on a little bit of a high note uh, or at least a funny note, I'll say with, with a cartoon, um, just about the real uh, aspect or the real point of diversity that we're talking about is that we're bringing in so many different folks that have got so many different experiences and talents and unique talents that we really have to expand and open up our academic medicine environment and wherever you're working um, to, to include everyone in that and not just have one standard bearer that everyone else has to measure up to. So we've got a ton of resources. These are a couple of the reports and the data directly from the WMC that I referenced. Uh, they are up on our website and I'm happy to provide uh, any other links, but let's get to the questions and please feel free to reach out to me. Uh, you can email me anytime if you've got any further questions or want to continue the conversation. I just want to Thank you for listening um, and giving us this platform to be with you tonight. Thank you so much, Diana. Um, what a great presentation. So much food for thought there um, and, uh, and so many resources. And I think there will be many people who uh, watch this presentation later and share it. So it will be um, it will be appreciated. There were some questions that were submitted um, with registration, and I wanted to uh, share those with you and Allison. Uh, the first is, what advice do you have for recently graduated women in medicine seeking their first job and negotiating for their first salary? How can we know what is re reasonable to ask for given the pervasive cultural taboo against asking others about salary information? So I will start with the with a bit of it and then I think Diana can fill in some um, very you know practical resources as well. So that you know pervasive taboo. Mm, why don't we break it? Um, and I actually, um, so when I was negotiating, after I went to my, you know, halfway through my career, but there's no reason why you can't do this at the beginning, is, um, so, so two different things. If you're staying at the same place that you are, um, you should have ideally, you know, have some mentors and more senior people that you can talk to about that. Um, and, um, you know, some near peers. Um, and I was shocked when I was negotiating um, one of my um, dean positions 
Um, there was no one like me at my place. So I called people up, some of whom I was good friends with and some of whom I only sort of knew and said, you know, I'm getting this new position. Um, any thoughts? And they shared freely, actually. So that's, that's one piece. Um, and then the other thing is sometimes if you're at a state school, um, salaries are very public. Um, and then if not, AMC has some resources as well. But it's been shocking to me over and over again how often when you ask, people will share or they will, you know, or a portion of people will share. So I would encourage you to quietly, you know, ask, ask around actually. And then there's some more concrete resources that I can talk about. Yeah. So a couple of things I know in the GWIMS, we talk a lot about, there are actual folks at your institution or at other institutions that you can get in touch with that help with initial contract negotiation because coming out of residency or you know, your first job, it can be completely in Greek, unless people here speak Greek. Um, it can be really confusing. And so there are folks that can actually walk you through that. That's not a process you need to do all by yourself. A couple of resources that we've got, um, and I'm going to drop in the chat right now. Um, GWIMS has a really extensive uh, toolkit series, and we actually have one on getting your first job in academic medicine. So we would encourage you to take a look at that, all of the things that you need to think about. Um, and you could just Google uh, GWIMS toolkit and it will pop up in one of the first links of other um, chapters. There is also a negotiation toolkit. That's part of that. Um, but since we're talking about salaries, um, I'd also encourage folks to leverage the AAMC's compensation data in this area. We have what's called the faculty salary survey. Um, and it is only $45 for an individual person to get access to that. And anyone can um, get a login and a password to WMC's website. Um, and you know, if you need any help finding it, I'm, I'm happy to help with that. But that's got really great information across the country at um, a majority of medical schools of broken down by you know, what department you're in, what faculty rank you are, even what region you're in, because we know that salaries vary so much regionally. So that's a fantastic resource. It's not a perfect, you know, exactly the number, but I think it gives folks a good baseline or a good range of what they should be going for if you're going up for assistant professor, you know, of surgery in the Northeast region. So that's another resource. And salary matters, starting salary matters, but as you know, um, there's a lot of other things in that initial offer letter. Um, and so finding out, asking, you know, so if you've had a mentor or you've been in a lab, um, asking that person, what should I be asking for? They want you to succeed. Um, and so you won't know, you know, how many, how much protected time do you get? Do you get money for professional development? If you're an educator, can you say, I want you to guarantee that you're going to, you know, fund me to do a master's. I don't, I'm not getting a startup for a lab, but I want you to train me up more. Um, you know, how much protected time do you get? Do you get a part-time or full-time um, lab assistant? And what level are they? And for how long? Um, and all of those things are things that it's worth asking both near peers, people who have been mentors um, and people at other associations as well. Just say, you know, can I see your offer letter? So you make sure you ask for everything you should be thinking about. Do you uh, have any resources for um, women who may decide not to stay in academics um, and go out into either an employed uh, a position or a private practice position um, where I think um, the issues of sharing salaries might even be more challenging? Yeah, I don't have, um, having not been there myself, I don't have exact uh, suggestions, but I, I would just raise that um, it's important to know for your employer, sometimes it is actually against your um, employer's uh, policies to share compensation, which we wish wasn't the case, but we definitely don't want it to get you fired. So understanding your institution's um, policies around that. Again, we're, we're doing our part to try and get organizations to change that thinking, that mode of thinking. But in some institutions, it is against policy. And so just making sure that you're aware of that um, at the outset is really important. And, and 
to, and we have less data about um, you know going into private practice because that's not where you focus. Um, another question that was submitted, what can we do to advocate for access to high quality childcare for all? And what impact does the lack of childcare have on women physicians? And I think it's probably pretty dramatic, particularly coming off COVID, but very much interested in your thoughts. Yeah, I think it has a huge impact or go ahead, Allison. No, go ahead. I was gonna say you should start. <laughs> um, and there are a couple of things for us to think about, especially after COVID. Um, you know, we we actually did a survey about six months into the pandemic to really understand how institutions were or were not responding. Um, and what we found in our survey, we we surveyed HR departments at academic medical centers. Um, to, to understand if they were doing anything about this. And we found that about half of all institutions provide some kind of childcare. Um, but what was really interesting was that if you weren't already providing childcare before the pandemic, you didn't add anything after the pandemic. It was you know like 96% of institutions that weren't providing anything. So the pandemic didn't really change their core institutional values about whether or not they see this as part of um, overall employee wellness and part of you being part of that environment. Um, so, you know, that that really spoke volumes to us, especially this description that kind of there's a chasm <laughs> between institutions that have the resources and see it as an institutional value to provide child care. Um, and then the last part that I'll just say about that um, is really, again, degendering the way that we think about childcare. And um, there are ways in our language that we can start to, you know, if we're encouraging everyone and all to, to um, take parental leave or to use childcare, um, you know, I think that we can help some of the status quo around caregiving being a woman's role. Um, how can we change our language to really um, interrogate that? If I can add just one other thing in terms of you know how to get that, um, this would be almost the same answer that I would use for any change that you want to make at your institution. Is that there? You need to identify who the champion would be. Um, is it faculty affairs? Is it academic affairs? Is it the diversity office? Um, and then work with them to make um, the case. Um, and you know one of the best ways to make the case is to reach out to other schools that have done this. Um, find out what they did, benchmark how many uh, schools are doing this, and then, um, you know, figure out is it a business case, is it a retention case, um, and continue to push that way. Uh, we can learn so much by, again, reaching out, um, and I, and, but you do need to identify the person who is in a position with um, either the authority or the ear to the person with authority, which is, you know, more often the dean or, you know, some equivalent um, or sometimes it's a combination, depending on your organization. Is it the school or is it actually the hospital system that is more equipped to create those kinds of things to support the people that are providing the care? Um, and it's not uncommon, actually a hospital will drive it um, because of um, nursing needs and you know, longer hours and things. So again, reach out and talk and, and network um, and find your champion. I think we have time for one more question, and this is something that comes up um, not uncommonly. What happens when a salary disparity is discovered between you and a colleague? What are the recommended next steps? So again, I, I, I think it depends on your context. Um, and unfortunately, it depends on your local culture. Um, and um, I think it depends on what um, the policies and the systemic changes that are in place. So in some places, um, if they have gender equity, robust gender equity systemically planned, there's someone in charge. It's typically faculty affairs or diversity office. Um, and you can have that discussion um, and they will likely have a cogent answer. Um, if they don't, if you don't have that, you know, it's a whole nother story. Um, then I think you really need to, to suss out, you know, what is safe to do because um, 
there are variations within cultures. And that's where building, and this is not my strength, the building your trusted network of peers and near peers, and even people you know, who are more junior to you and you know, more senior mentors, men and women. My best, absolute best mentor on women's issues was um, a man that I worked for in the lab. Um, and so don't, don't think that, again, don't be uh, gender biased in, in who you reach out for. And, and, and figure that out. So who can be your trusted partners to understand your culture and what you can and can't do? I would love to say, you know, there's a system, everyone does it, but that's not the case. And I would just offer, again, it would, it would be great if we could get more institutions regularly doing equity analyses um, across the board so that they can identify these issues. Um, I think the first step is to, to do your homework um, and making sure that you understand the full context because there are lots of, because compensation is so complicated in academic medicine for those who are in the academic side, um, really understanding if, if you know this other person, if they're in the same faculty rank as you and they're in the same department, if there's any kind of uh, ability to um, engender that relationship and to have a conversation about it and to find out, does that person have other leadership responsibilities? Is there something else to kind of account for that salary difference? And then if not, um, going to uh, your chair or going to your business administrator, most large departments have a business administrator, someone in HR um, to actually ask about that and to, and to really um, do that work because they really do need to address it. it as a, a point of information, um, this came up as we were discussing at the talk yesterday. It appears that the University of Rochester Medical Center is about to embark on a survey of gender uh, equity in salaries, et cetera, but uh, it has not occurred at this point. So, um, and I just wanted to reach out, Erica, did you have a, um, a question or a comment you wanted to make? Um, I just wanna say, I love that idea that um, Diana said about um, de-gendering childcare, I think, um, I, and so I just put that um, little phrase where we, we hear working mother, working mother, working mother, but then when do you ever hear working father? And I heard that and it just struck me so much. Um, um, so I really appreciate that. And also just really appreciate this talk. It was really um, enlightening and inspiring and sometimes depressing, but um, I think we have a, a path forward. Always our challenge, not, not to make it depressing. <laughs> I'm going to hand it back over to Dr. Kwan. Thank you so much. Can I just say one other thing about that depressing piece, mm -hmm. right? Having lived it, mm -hmm. which is um, you're experiencing that all along. You just don't know it. So if you can be conscious of it, <laughs> it can actually validate some things that have been eating away at you or empower you to change things that you didn't know were being undervalued. So mm -hmm. I had to live with it for a while, but that's why it's good to see this. I don't see it as, as a demoralizing, although it is initially, but like, okay, this is the reality I'm living in and I'm gonna change it for myself and others. Thank you so much for such incredibly outstanding and powerful talks and obviously so much more intentional work needs to be done. Um, at this time, I would like to thank Dr. Allison Whelan, Whelan and Diana Lautenberger for their presentations as part of the Women in Medicine four-part virtual series. I would also like to thank you for joining us. Watch for invitations for part two in the fall and keep an eye out for a survey in your email as well as a recording of the presentation to follow. And a, a reminder to please stay connected with the School of Medicine and Dentistry by joining, joining the Meliora Collective the university's online networking and mentoring platform. Um, we will share the slides and link in the chat. If you're not already a member, please join the collective as well as the Med Connects and Women in Medicine groups within the collective. We look forward to being together again soon. Thank you so much. <laughs>